the mic working? Yep. Yep. Great. Okay. It's nine o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm Brooks Davis. I'm here to talk to you today about uh, Cherry ABI, our work to do hardware for spatial and referential memory safety in processes. Uh, we've done the work on FreeBSD. The concepts apply everywhere, but I'll be talking about FreeBSD today. Um, let's start uh, with the punchline. Um, it works. Um, we've got the full FreeBSD operating system compiling uh, with hardware and for spatial and referential memory safety. This covers programs, libraries, dynamic linker, um, and kernel access to user memory, uh, which is to say that if the kernel attempts to access some array in user space that the user has passed, then regardless of whether the, the uh, user gave it the right, right length, it won't exceed the bounds of the allocation of the array. Um, performance is generally acceptable. We have some overhead. I'll get to it later. Um, and some significant third-party software, not just the relatively small C programs in the base system or the very small C++ programs, um, excluding LLVM, um, but the Postgres database and WebKit, which is one way or another the basis for most modern web browsers. Um, so first off, let me give you a quick introduction to Cherry. Um, we've been working on the Cherry project. I think we submitted the grant in 2010. We started working. Uh, we started work uh, shortly thereafter, and our first publication was in 2012. So the overall system is relatively complicated. There's lots of details, but the concept, the basic concepts that we're going to work with today, are pretty simple. Cherry introduces a new register type. Uh, the capability. You can think of this as being analogous to how floating point and integer registers are different. There's also capability registers in our system. Um, cherry capabilities grant access to bounded regions of virtual address space, and they are protected in registers and memory by tags. Um, so we first articulated this in detail in a, in a paper in 2014 at ISCA. Um, so now let's talk about this a bit more. So architecturally speaking, Cherry capabilities replace a 64-bit virtual address um, with a tag providing integrity, bounds limits, um, which set the range that can be accessed, and permissions, uh, which control what kind of operations can be performed through the capability. So that's load, store, load or store capability, instruction fetch, um, and the like. 100. So one problem with that architectural model that I showed you before is that these capabilities architecturally are 256 bits. Unsurprisingly, if you talk to people who have architectures, they tell you that no, they cannot increase the pointer, increase pointers by a factor of four. It's just not going to fly. So we have instead uh, built a 128-bit version of capabilities, where we uh, compress bounds relative to a 64-bit virtual address. address. This, um, these floating point bounds place some constraints on the alignment of objects and on the sizes of allocations. Um, so there's, you know, round up, or rounding up already occurs in, for instance, malloc allocations, um, just due to uh, trying to keep buckets efficient and whatnot. Um, but the security properties are all maintained. Um, that is provenance and monotonicity, which I'll get to in a bit. Um, we have strong C language support that includes things like out of bounds pointers, so you can take your pointer out of bounds a bit and then bring it back in and then dereference it. Um, this is technically not allowed by the C standard, um, but it in fact occurs all the time. Uh, and it goes not just the little bit that is allowed, which is that you can have a pointer to just past the end of an allocation. So, um, in compressing capabilities, this does have one cost, which is that the tags that guarantee validity, um, the number of them goes up. So we go from 0.4% of uh, DRAM to 0.8% a, a uh, overhead. But uh, otherwise, this dramatically reduces the memory pressure and the cache pressure that these capabilities uh, So we have a full prototype of this working um, on top of MIP64 and running on an FPGA. Um, so, better checker capabilities sort of work in practice in, in, uh, in, in use. So, all memory accesses in a Cherry system are constrained by Cherry capabilities. That's either explicit, where you load a capability and then you use that capability to load, store, whatever, um, through new instructions, or implicit, 
um, which is in the legacy MIPS API, API um, where we have a default data capability for loads and stores and a default program counter, cap and program counter capability um, for, uh, for jumps and branches and whatnot. Uh, it's important to note here that a key feature of our capability system versus many other many research capability systems in the past is that you can take a cherry processor that's running MIPS 64 and you can run a completely unmodified MIPS, MIPS program operating system on it, completely un unmodified MIPS user space. Um, and that means there is a transition path. So now let's talk about so you know it's great that you can load and store through capabilities, but how do you create them? How do you how do you manipulate them? Um, capabilities are used and manipulated in special registers, as I said before, using special capability instructions. These instructions ensure that manipulations are monotonic, which is to say that you can only decrease the bounds when you do an operation or leave them the same. And similarly, you can only decrease permissions. Um, so there's a there's and firm operations where you hand the permissions with some, some set up some mask or set address uh, where you adjust the address of a pointer. Um, there's a set bounds operation that, that bounds off it. Um, and these capabilities can be stored in memory where, where they are protected by a tag. Um, this mean, the important thing here is that if you do a conventional store or you store some random integer um, to the add to somewhere that holds a capability, that tag is clear. So when that point, when that is loaded into memory and you try to access it, you get a fault. That means that traditional buffer overflows, you know, it's a sort of a traditional attack on, say, a stack overflow attack where you're trying to smash a return address. If you just do a write through a character array, you just blow your return address away. Um, so so that's that's quite a handy property. Now one of the things we did with Cherry capabilities is from the start, we intended that these capabilities be usable as pointers in C. So, if, so, so many of our design constraints are around the fact that we must do this. I already alluded to the fact that you needed to be able to take pointers temporarily out of bounds and then come back in. Um, we also, it's also common to use, for instance, a void star in C, and sometimes it's a pointer and sometimes it's an integer. Um, and you're supposed to figure that out. Um, so we have to we have to have the ability to store regular integers inside our pointers. So we've we've ensured that that's possible. We have an untagged store or an untagged capability then. Um, and because we want performance to not get really weird, um, in some capability systems, for instance, you would have to um, go to the kernel to use a privileged instruction to manipulate a capability, and that's how it maintains safety. You can't possibly do that if you're going to have C pointers. You can't be going off to the kernel three or four times for every time you're you know, moving through an array. That would be ridiculous. Um, and similarly, we don't want to have protection buffers or protection tables off to the side, which introduce, which, um, introduce the possibility of more page faults and more cache misses. So no tables. There, there are no tables, and there are, there are few privileged operations, and they are not required to run a program. Um, so we have two compilation modes where we can use these cherry capabilities as pointers. The first one, the one we started with, is a hybrid mode where we slap an annotation on a pointer and say, this pointer is a capability. So, you know, so it's bigger, it has stronger alignment requirements, it's, you know, it's just another type, but it's bigger and has stronger alignment requirements, but other pointers remain in our integer virtual addresses. Um, we started there because it was easier, but also, we're, still, we're using that in the kernel um, for this Cherry ABI work. The second mode, which is the focus of the Cherry ABI work, is a pure capability mode. In pure capability mode, um, all pointers are capabilities automatically. Um, we started to talk about the implications of this C work in a, in a paper at ASPOC in 2015, um, but we just scratched the surface. Um, so let's talk a bit more about the pure capability process environment with Cherry ABI. Um, so it's built on top of Cherry BSD, which is a fork of FreeBSD with Cherry support. Um, again, all, pointer, all pointers in the program are capabilities, and this includes system call arguments and return values from, from the kernel. Um, our goal are to minimize bounds um, of these pointers 
Um, so we, we limit them to C language objects generally, but we also bound, for instance, if you use mmap to give you some, some virtual address space in memory, we return a bounded object, um, not just a virtual address. Um, and our, our goal overall with this is we want to we want to do these these things to, to add protection to our programs. We want most programs to require no effort. We want to just recompile them, and that's it. And boom, you get protection. Uh, so I set out to do this work on pure capability mode after we had used the pure capability stuff a bit in very constrained environments. You know, we put gzip and libping in the sandboxes. And to do that, we sheared off all their system call support, uh, mostly by just throwing in stuff that failed. Um, and then we didn't use those code paths. But it was a lot of work. So I wanted to be able to just recompile things and have everything work. Um, we also used it in, in another paper where we, uh, we used Cherry Pure Capability Mode to provide security to a Java prompt, to a, a Java JNI. Um, so we could actually enforce the bounds of the language in the C part, which, you know, unfortunately, your average your average JVM has over a million lines of C code in it, so you know, security. Yeah. Um, so our implementation. Um, so we implemented it in FreeBSD as a compatibility layer, uh, much like the FreeBSD 32-bit code. Um, this has some advantages and disadvantages. The big advantage was I could I could continue to boot and run stuff, and run a debugger and all that stuff um, on mixed code as I brought things up. Um, so, as I said before, the kernel's a hybrid program. We've also modified some structures, like struct IOVEC, to always use capabilities. Um, and that is because struct IOVEC might be getting, might be coming directly from a Cherry ABI process, or it might be coming from the kernel. So it has to be capable of holding capabilities. Um, now, as, as I alluded before, all user space capability, all user space access is via capability. So we have um, capability aware versions of the usual copy in, copy out functions. Um, we, and if you are in a Cherry ABI process and you try to use copy in or copy out without the, without being capability aware, you just get an error. Uh, we check that you're not in a Cherry ABI process before we allow it. We do allow it for legacy processes. Um, just for simplicity, but, um, but for Cherry ABI processes, you must use the capability aware code if you want to access user space. Um, and as a bit of paranoia, um, we actually don't copy capabilities between user space and the kernel unless we're using an explicit variant, um, which does that because most of the time you're copying an array or something. So we don't want, for instance, a kernel stack leak. Um, to result in leaking um, some kernel function pointer that was a return address or something. We definitely don't want to leak a capability to that. That would be bad. Um, so, so most of the time, we don't copy capabilities at all. Um, so let's talk about user space a bit. Um, since, since we're implemented as a compat layer, um, we have, much like the, the user lib32 foot libraries in, um, we have a user lib cherry have these pure capability versions of libraries. Um, one difference to the current FreeBSD build system is that we build those before we build programs, and we've modified the build infrastructure for programs so that you can specify in the make files, do I want, you know, whatever version they use, you know, do, do, I, do I want to build as a legacy mix binary or as a hybrid binary, which is to say mostly a legacy mix binary with a bit of chip capability support, um, or as a pure capability binary. Um, and so we can mix and match, which was really helpful in development, um, because it meant that I could say, oh, you know, I've got a, you know, I've got some test programs working. Uh, you know, Echo works great, um, but you know, Shell, uh, Shell's sort of hard and weird and stress tests. So we'll we'll keep those off for now while we start debugging the things that are easier, um, and then change up what, how we're building various things over time. Um, I'd actually like to merge that into FreeBSD at some point because we've had some cases where we specifically wanted, for instance, a 32-bit x86 binary um, to be a to be built. So we should we should actually make that change locally. Um, so we have and, and in the process of doing this, and to make sure we could do fair comparisons, reasonably fair AV comparisons between mixed code and cherry code, we've gotten our slightly custom LLVM tool chain. 
um, to be able to be an external tool chain for bridging these two things. Um, so let me take a little digression here. Um, one of the things that came up as we were, as I was working on Cherry API and trying to think about what's the right thing to do anytime you're, you know, returning a capability from the kernel or um, or installing a capability during a startup, um, we came up with the concept to try to help us think about the overall set of permissions of a process, and we call this the abstract capability. Um, Again, it's the set of permission the process has is relative to a particular paid virtual address mapping. These capabilities are virtual address relative. Um, but it, there's a, it turns out that there's a bunch of state in a process that can't be trivially mapped to the architectural capabilities. So for instance, if a process has a, if, if part of a process is paged out to disk, well, disks don't have tags. Um, you know, we're not going to alter the way, we're not going to alter the format of the PCI bus and the disks and everything on the way to trying to get this to work. Convincing people to change their DRAM controller and their ISA is probably a big enough leap. Um, so these abstract capabilities are constructed and maintained in a collaboration of like the kernel, the kernel and the language runtime. And so I'm going to walk through some of the parts of this, of how we do this. Um, this is really how we make Cherry AI into a, an actual working thing. So let's, let's start at the beginning. Let's consider a system at PowerOn. Now PowerOn in a Cherry system, there are two capabilities in the system. One is the default data capability, one is the program counter capability. This lets you run legacy code. Um, and that, that, that's where you start. These both in the current model are both omniscient capabilities with all permissions. Um, all the other registers are zero, and all the tags in memory are clear. Um, so that means there's no other sources of capabilities. Now we do, during early boot, we start manipulating these capabilities. And we end up in a state where we've removed the executable permission from DDC in the kernel, and we've removed the write permission from the program cache. So we have WXRX enforced here. Um, and then we've created some other capabilities. So we've created a user root, which is the root capability for all processes. It can cover, it covers all memory or all addresses that are accessible to a user program. And all capabilities that we put into a user program are derived from this capability. We also have a swap capability. This one's slightly unfortunate and that is the omniscient capability um, because sometimes we swap kernel pages. Uh, so we need to be able to have this capability around to restore the capabilities that we've swapped at. Um, now, next up, in, you know, from a process's perspective, the next interesting thing is exact BE. So you've now forked a process and you want to load a program. So we're going to load a Cherry API program. Now, we've got some, we're going to set up some initial register values for that program. Um, starts out as a blank set of, empty set of registers. Um, we map a thread stack, um, we map a program binary, we map a runtime linker, we map some space for prospects arguments. Mm -hmm. That space includes argument and environment strings. It includes the ELF auxiliary arguments vector, um, the array of environment variables, and the uh, argument uh, vector. These all point into these strings that I talked about before. Um, and then in our model, we have a, we've added pointers from the ELF auxiliary arguments vector to the environment and argument uh, arrays. Um, there's also, as usual, pointers to the program binary, the runtime linker, et cetera. In Cherry API programs, remember I talked about legacy instructions are all via this default data capability. Well, in Cherry API, the default cap data capability is null. So we don't support legacy load and store instructions at all. Um, program counter capability is set up to point to the runtime linker as usual. Um, as, as the program counter would be stack capability is set up to point to the stack. Um, and, we add, and we pass, in our API, we pass the, as a first argument a pointer to the ELF auxiliary arguments array. This is different from other ABIs. Other ABIs pass pointers to, to the uh, argument array, or to, Sorry, to uh, argv, 
Um, and then they do this evil thing where they find the environment array by walking off the end of RB. And then they find the oxards array later by also walking off the end of the environment array. This is not actually valid C, but you know it's in the runtime, so it's OK that it's not valid. Uh, Filer authors have to deal with it. Um, so, you know, so rather than relying on that specific knowledge, we just pass a pointer to the LBOXARs array, and we, uh, and from there we dig out pointers to the other things. So that, that gives us a little slightly cleaner bootstrap. Um, on a lot of architectures, we could probably actually make that change by passing it as some as an additional uh, argument array. It might be worth doing. Now, let's talk about virtual memory. The virtual memory subsystem has both programmer visible and programmer invisible to the abstract capability maintenance jobs. Um, programmer visible wise, um, it provides new mappings to, to uh, of memory. So it reserves address space and maps things into them through mmap and shemmap. It also alters and frees those mappings. Uh, in terms of abstract capability maintenance, which is pro largely programmer invisible, um, it ensures the correct virtual and physical mapping. This is exactly the same as a regular program. Um, it's just one of these things we take for granted um, in our, in our, as a program in a process address space that um, the kernel ensures that the pages are mapped correctly. Um, sort of critical, but we just, we just assume it's true. Um, and that's not changed. Um, it also does things like preserve stored capabilities, swap capabilities stored in swap. So a little more on, on, on MMAP. MMAP allocates virtual address space and it changes mappings. You know, this is a bit conflated, um, which is somewhat awkward, and that address space reservation and page mapping are really quite different things, um, but MMAP mushes them together. Um, so in Cherry ABI, MMAP returns a bounded pointer. Um, and in our current model, a, a mapping that can't be represented precisely in our floating point model is simply rejected. So we require that the programmer do round up, round things up as required. Um, we'll probably change that over time, but that's, that's the way it works right now. Um, we have macros to do it, it's very simple. Um, and then it sets permissions that are based on the page permissions requested by MMAP. Um, the goal here was to try to sort of follow the, follow the principle of least privilege as much as we can. So if a user says, I want a read-write page, then they get a read-write capability to that read-write page. Um, we've added an extension to that um, called PlotMax, which we add to the to the protection flag, flags of MMAP that says, so, you know, I'm currently mapping read-write or I'm currently mapping prop-none, but really I'd like to be, become, be able to become executable at some point. The prop-none thing is important because it's used by um, virtualization systems and by the runtime linker, where the first thing they do is they reserve some space, um, and then they, you know, map some of it, um, executable and some of it read-write and whatnot, and they, and they fill in bits, you know, they fill in the, the BSS, which is all the zero part, things that initialize to zero in the program. Um, and the sensible thing to do is map, map it with none so that the bits that you don't initialize state plot none. Um, but if we had just done our simple model, we couldn't, we would we have ended up creating a capability to a library, for instance, that didn't have any permissions. So that wouldn't be useful. So we added PropMax to support that. Um, we're actually looking at trying to merge that into FreeBSD um, because it allows you to, it, it, it's also helpful, for instance, for um, enforcing read-write uh, WXRX, where you want to ensure that you never have both write and execute. But you'd also perhaps like to have your malloc, malloc data never be able to come executable. Um, so we're, we're looking at merging some of this in um, as a mitigation as well. Just turns out to have been a useful idea. Um, now, let me talk a little bit more about swap. I've already done some, but I'll give you a work example here. So let's consider a page in user space that we decide we want to swap out. It has a couple of capabilities in it. Um, and we have some tag-free storage. So what we've done in our current solution is we've added a tag bitmap to the swap metadata. Um, so we take that page, 
we store, we keep the tags in memory, and we store the, um, and, and we store the contents, the, the bits of the, of the page in, the, in storage, and then when we page back in, we use that swap root capability I talked, told you about before, merge all this, all this together, and we recreate those capabilities, we re-derive them, so we have the same capabilities um, that we did before. From the user's perspective, the page has always been there. Nothing's ever happened. You know, things got slow for a moment. Uh, but otherwise, uh, you know, everything's the same. Okay, another bit of the picture is the runtime linker. So in a conventional program, um, the runtime linker is responsible for loading and linking dynamic libraries, uh, for resolving symbols, and for entering the program initially. The, in, a, in a dynamic linking program, you start in the runtime linker and then start the program. In Cherry, there's an additional job here, which is that it synthesizes capabilities that are, for instance, global. So if you have a pointer to some a global variable that is defined to be a point, that is initialized to be a pointer to something, we can't store that on disk. Um, even if we know the address, we can't store it on disk because we can't store tags on disk. Um, so Cherry programs have, a, have an initialization routine as part of the, run, the runtime linker that creates these capabilities um, and derives them from the appropriate source. Um, this is also true in statically linked programs. So our, our static init bit looks a bit more like a runtime linker than, a, than a, a normal static program and there's a bit more work to do. Um, in addition, once the program is running, um, the runtime linker provides uh, on-demand loading of libraries and there are some bits where to support exception handling um, where the runtime linker is responsible for returning pointers, which is to say capabilities in this case, um, to portions of the library that's to aid stack on Now, the C runtime. So, the C runtime um, is responsible for back placing bounds on a number of objects. So, when you call malloc and you allocate some amount of memory, we bound the allocation as closely to the request size as we can, and, we sure, and if necessary, we round up for the allocation further to ensure that the, the capability you get back only refers to memory in that allocation. Um, we all adjust bounds or allocate new storage as required, much as it usually does. Um, and then we have thread local storage is also bounded. In our current implementation, we actually bound thread local storage on a per library, per shared object basis, which is per library, uh, rather than per object, to avoid adding yet another level of interaction. Yes? Just to clarify for realloc, that means that you have to realloc every time because you can't increase the size of the bound, right? Um, no, so, so the question was, do you have to realloc every time, or do you have to do a full reallocation every time? Um, the answer is no, you don't have to, because you can return a different capability. Okay. Now, if the code is naive about updating multiple pointers and does makes the wrong choice, that might result in failure to update. Um, as long as the code always updates, everything's okay. Uh, I'll show you another example of realloc later, though, about how realloc is bad. Um, so, uh, compiler generated code also sets bounds on stacks, automatic allocations, and global objects. One useful thing here, one, one thing we found here that's important is to start with, any time we were making and doing an operation on something on the stack, we would create a capability and put bounds on it. We eventually concluded that was dumb um, because most of the time, your operations on something on the stack are something the compiler is generating. If the compiler can't be trusted to write to the right object, you know, to write to that integer on the stack, then just all game, it's game over. So it's not like they're going to get the, the compiler app is going to get the bounds right. So we don't generate bounds in those cases. But if you take a reference to something on the stack and pass it to something, that is a capability. <clears throat> and we do a, appropriate alignment to ensure that capability is precise. Okay, now system calls. System calls were in fact why I started all this work in 2015. Um, is, so let's consider a read. We want to make a read system call. So I have a little user space program, it's got a thread stack, there's a buffer on the stack. Um, now we want to make a system call. So we 
set up in our registers that we want to call the read system call. Um, then we have some file descriptor we're passing. Um, we create a capability pointer to the buffer, and we pass some some length. Now this goes into a, a read system call implementation, and then it goes into the generic version, and eventually we work our way down to uh, to, the, to a copy out which takes which copies data into that buffer. Now because that buffer is capability and it is bound into whatever the language runtime said it should be. Even if the programmer screws up and sets end byte to something really ridiculously large, bigger than the array, the copy out will, will hit the end of that buffer. Um, and it will return to default or deprot, um, and you will get an error rather than a buffer overflow. Um, we had hoped that we would go out and we would look around and we find all these buffer overflows where people were using the kernel to overflow buffers. Sadly, that doesn't appear to be true. My hypothesis is that there is so much low-hanging fruit that no one's bothered. Uh, and that, that seems to be generally the case, is that you know, no exploit people are lazy. Um, so they like finding new clever new exploits, but really there's, you know, there's plenty of ground without having to mess with the kernel. So that's my guess. Um, let me give you an example of the kind of changes we had to make to the kernel to make this work. Um, so we've added a new, a new shim in the case of read um, between the, the, what would be the sys thing that is the top, top thing that takes a, a, a structure of arguments and the kern bit that's an implementation. Um, and here we've added a little thing that I called user for their FBA, so it's called user. Um, and so, so this thing is called by both sysread and cherry ABI read. It, it has demuxed the arguments, and the arguments are now always a capability to the buffer. So sysread now generates a capability and bounds it to end byte before passing it to this, this part. Um, the other change here is that because we've, because um, IOVEX are now always capabilities, um, it had a couple awkward implications, so I put macros around them um, to make them easier to create. Uh, so we do initialization through a macro. We also advance the pointer using a macro because it obviates the need for some casts to make some casts visible. Um, so these changes are pretty straightforward. There are a lot of system calls that have stuff. Many of them require changes. Another type of change we've had to make in user space um, for Cherry AI is, <clears throat> so there's a number of things where we manipulate pointers as integers. One of the many ways we do this is that we take a pointer and we either check its alignment as we're doing here, or we, you know, we take an array or a, you know, or a buffer, or an object that has a buffer after it, and we align that buffer up to some alignment requirement. So we're doing bit manipulation on the pointer um, because of the way we initially interpreted UA pointer, uh, UA pointer T at the, at the address. It was awkward to directly manipulate that because we were taking, we were actually interpreting the integer as the offset within the capability from the base. Um, and that, so the results wouldn't necessarily be correct. We've now changed that interpretation in most cases, <clears throat> but we still have these changes that create. So here, we're checking that a page is a lot, that this thing is aligned to a super page um, in, in JA malloc. Um, we've added some compiler built-ins to do this work. Um, so we have both this is aligned check but we also have um, a line up and a line, or round up and round down, or I think a line up and a line, a line down uh, built-ins. One advantage of the built-ins is they can actually be somewhat type preserving, uh, whereas um, evil macros are just whacking around with casts through long or whatnot, um, results in loss of type information. Um, another example here, so, briefly alluded to notion of provenance. In provenance, what we're talking about here is that a pointer, any pointer has, has been derived from any from some other pointer which point, which pointed to a, at least that region, um, all the way back to that root, that user root capability. Um, we ran into a number of cases, including this one in Reali, um, where here we have a, you know, we've, we've realloc to set us a, a, a a buffer that holds a bunch of strings, 
And now we needed to, previously we were updating the pointer by taking the difference between the old pointer and the new pointer and adding it to each of the, each of the pointers. The problem here is that the pointer, is that we're just adding an offset to the old pointer, which means that what we've now updated is derived from the old pointer. So what all we've done here is created a bunch of out of bounds pointers, which fail. So we needed to make this code change so that we are now deriving the pointer from the new pointer um, rather than updating the old pointer. It is worth noting here that despite having made this change, and I've made this a couple times, this one I think is in the C shell, um, this code is unbehaviorated uh, in multiple ways. First off, you can't compare two pointers that aren't you can't compare two pointers that are unrelated to each other. Well, so I guess that part we're not, that was the part of the failure before. The, the current one doesn't, doesn't compare two pointers that are not to the same object. Um, but it does have the problem that the old value could be anything. Um, and in fact, nothing in the C standards stops you from, since we all read that old pointer, having walked memory and obliterated all those old pointers. Uh, so, um, in fact, there's a, I work on a C standards body that's looking at pointer provenance for C, um, for the, ne the next standard. The conclusion there is that this use of realloc is simply unsafe. Uh, and the only thing you can do here is use malloc and free. Um, that, that there's no way that they can make this, this safe um, from optimization. Could yes, you could say the offsets in a list of front, like just compare offset parameters? Yes, you, 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 could, could, you, you could allocate a new array. And just, off, just to hold the offsets. Just to hold the offsets. offsets but then you'd have a bunch of allocations. So why not just do free, malloc and free? Basically, mm -hmm. um, I, I would say that one of the things, if you were going to productionize this, is you would go read the, the, the 18, 1800 or something realloc instances in the tree, and you would replace oh. all the ones that are like this. Any realloc, the, the, the general view that I think you should take and the orchestra group is taking is that if you're not just extending an array, it's unsafe. And you shouldn't do it. Realloc was a mistake. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, and so if you're, not, if you're not just doing trivial things with realloc, you should assume that they're broken. And, and that the compiler authors will happily break them for you eventually. <laughs> because we know them. Um, so, you know, I've talked a little bit about changes we've had to make. I got a quick summary. In FreeBSD user space, we've had to change about 1% of files, about 200 files. Um, most of that was in libraries, most of that was in libc. Um, so, despite the fact that we've, you know, changed the way pointer, pointer integer manipulation works and whatnot, I think we had three changes in OpenSSL, and that's because they're doing evil. Um, and we're assuming you can XOR pointers together get results at the other end, um, things like that. But like libc, it's mostly in libc. The kernel's a bit of a different case. The reason the kernel has about this, this a bit less than 6% of changes is because, for instance, IO vec, you know, every time you do an IO vec, I've added this macro. Um, and because it's a hybrid program, I carry this underscore underscore capability annotation all the way down through the whole system call layer and down to the point wherever it is that you're doing copy and copy out. So those changes are bigger. We are working on a pure capability kernel, where again, all pointers would be capabilities, where you don't need to make many of those changes. Um, the question, of course, is what will the performance implications be? Um, so it might be that you'd still want to make these changes if you want to have a choice as to which, which, which way you want to do things. But um, we, haven't, we haven't figured that out yet. Um, you know, the real reason it's a hybrid program is that actually when we started that, we couldn't even make it a hybrid program. Um, so all our capability manipulation was through assembly stuffs. Um, so this is a big advance, it's much better. Um, so I would say most of these changes, for instance, the realloc changes, improve code quality. So you know, we add better abstraction. We, add, we, we clean up terrible things people do with pointers. Um, so I've been upstreaming things. Additionally, because I'm working in a compact framework um, and adding things, if I'm doing something to make Cherry ABI work better, 
usually there's a missing or broken FreeBSD32 thing next to it. Um, and I started from FreeBSD32, so I've been improving that. I've been upstreaming things there. A little change, change in focus here. So we, I said one of our goals was to minimize bounce. So how well have we done? I can't tell you how well we've done versus some objective truth um, of the perfect bounds, but I can tell you that we've reduced bounds quite a bit. So in this graph, we have a bunch of lines which are for different types of allocations. What portion of the allocations are smaller than whatever the, the uh, uh, x-axis is? Um, the thing is, the graph should be bigger, is better, and that is totally unreadable. There is a blue arrow uh, pointing up to the left, uh, to the upper left. Um, so that's, um, so we want the graph to be up that way. In a, in a, a pure, in a hybrid mode program, there are no capability bounds. This is a vertical line somewhere over here because it is, um, because every pointer can point to the whole darn address space. Um, so I think we've done fairly well. We have no pointers to the whole address space. Uh, we do have a few, and most things are well less than a page um, in this uh, trace of an OpenS cell server. Um, we have some large stack references, which are, well, sometimes you're manipulating the whole stack. So yeah, occasionally you reference the whole stack. Um, and there's a small number of whole shared object references that are made during loading shared objects. Next up, performance. Um, so micro benchmarks, generally acceptable for performance. Um, most of these benchmarks are super pointer heavy things like trees that are just pointers. Um, so this is intended to be worst case scenario. Generally we're looking at less than 10% overhead. Um, in this case, we ran a bunch of benchmarks that are like crypto and bit manipulation and stuff. We didn't include them here because one artifact of a decision made in 2011, um, is that we have more registers than a normal mix because um, we did the natural thing with mix, which is that Cherry is a coprocessor, which means it has its own address space and its own register space. So once you move all the pointers out of the integer registers, these really, really register hungry bit manipulation things get faster. So we're not trying them here because they're unrealistic. Um, and a, we believe a realistic architecture would have a merged register file um, where registers probably actually don't get wider because they're already 128 bits for vector, for vector things. Um, and but you have fewer registers, though. You have the same number of registers as you did before. Um, so we reflect a little bit on using FreeBSD for this work. So one good thing, really good thing, is that we have this well-abstracted um, process ABI infrastructure. Um, there are some downsides to that. You know, it's probably not great that we can run, in some ways, from a security perspective, it's not great that we can run ADOT out binaries from the, from the 90s, because um, we don't audit that code. Um, on the plus side, when I talk to like Linux and Windows people, they're like, this is gonna be really hard. It's like a new ABI, we don't have any way to do that. Or like in Linux, they have a way to have a 32-bit ABI for a 64 bit machine, but that's like a hard-coded thing. Um, whereas we can have a zillion ELF ABIs. It's, you know, it's good and bad, but from my perspective, it's great. It made this work much easier. Um, the Android people I talked to dumbfounded that we're like, oh yeah, there's just an abstraction for that every time they ask, how did you do this, this thing or that thing or that what, the other thing. Um, so that was nice. Um, the, the central generated system call tables that don't vary across architectures are really nice. Um, and I've made that actually quite a bit better on the way to deleting the FreeBSD32 syscall.master and generating everything from annotations. Um, and we have a single fairly hackable build system. You can hate our PMake infrastructure, our BSD make infrastructure all you want, but it's all one piece. Um, and I could hack on it and I could change it to let me you know, start linking some programs to spirit capability and some not. And oh, so that's a huge advantage to us. Some not so good things. Um, at some point in the past, we made a decision for the bioctal control interfaces that because they encode the size of the buffer and the direction of the buffer, we would from the copy in and copy out centrally. Um, so you said way, way back at the beginning, 
we now copy in capabilities from user space normally or copy them out, out of paranoia. Um, unfortunately for iOcto, we have to do it for everything because we don't know what the type is. Um, so that's quite unfortunate. Um, and in fact, there's some other, there's some, so that, that's a bit of an issue. One other thing, we have the test suite. It's, you know, it's there. Um, we, we used it in our evaluation. Unfortunately, the test runner is a yucky C++ program that lives in ports, and there's no easy way to build it stack. Um, so it's caused me no end of trouble. I'm currently running FreeBSD 10 binaries, because every time I try to sit down and build a new one, I fail to get something that works. So it's frustrating. Um, so we've got some work in progress. Um, on the Cherry front, we are in the process of taking the MIPS 64 ISA, and we're within a week or two, of, I hope, of um, publishing a new ISA reference, uh, version 7, which will also have preliminary RISC-V instructions. Uh, and we're under contract with DARPA to do RISC-V implementation. Uh, we've got to the, our current system, actually, the ISA reference is snippets from a formal model. We can assemble that formal model into something we can actually run, and we can synthesize on FPGA. It's not as fast as a hand-coded emulator, but we can actually take a formal model that we can prove properties about, and we can run FreeBSD on it. So we know it's like a real thing with real behavior. Um, we've got a new compressed capability format. I sort of alluded to the one there. Our initial work works one way. We're trying to save as many bits as possible so for other purposes that I haven't talked about in this talk. Um, so we've been, done a bunch of work. We have something in coming out in transactions on computers shortly. Um, <coughs> I said we, we do spatial and referential safety, but you know the, the glob of memory safety bugs, which is by the way like seventy something percent of all CVEs affecting Windows. Um, Microsoft's good at publishing things, so I'm using that. Or, or in the latest Adobe update, eighty three out of eighty five CVEs in this month's up, this week's update were memory safety. So temporal safety though is a large and growing portion. So it turns out, we believe anyway, that our capabilities provide the things required to do temporal safety. The conventional way of doing temporal safety with capabilities would be to do a table. We said those are bad, so we're not doing that. But it turns out, if you were willing to quarantine free, free pointers until you have accumulated enough of them, you could amortize the cost of sweeping all of memory. And with carry capabilities, you can tell what's a pointer because it has a tag. And you can tell what it pointed to. Because even if it's out of bounds, it's still got those bounds. So you can check that it's a subset of the thing you agree. So we can actually, our results are quite good so far. We're looking at average case less than 10% without much optimization, which is pretty good to solve temporal safety. Um, well, to solve reuse after free, after to solve reuse, reuse after reallocation. Um, so, some other work uh, I work on, um, I'd like to make Cherry ABI the default ABI. That would reduce the number of diffs a bit because then the default kernel data structure would contain, would have capabilities in it, and therefore I'd just be, and I have a, a FreeBSD64 that almost works. Um, it almost boots and then it hangs at the H5 design. Um, and then pure capability kernels I've talked about before. Some future FreeBSD work. Um, I'd like to continue cleaning up the, the compat layer. Um, I've been doing a bunch of code deduplication. Because I'm now adding... Oops. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. sorry. Okay. Um, so, because I'm now adding my second compat layer, I'm really anti-duplicate code, so you know, <laughs> ten-line duplication really offends me. So I've been adding more abstraction and cleanup and whatnot, uh, just because there's a lot of system calls and I hate copying and pasting. Um, so I've been doing a bunch of that. I want to um, my FreeBSD 64. I don't have a syscall.master. I generate everything similarly. Cherry API. I generate everything. I've been working on it slowly on doing it for FreeBSD32. Unfortunately, every time I do it, I find a deficiency in FreeBSD32 um, that requires work. 
and then that requires reviews and time and whatnot. So it'll get there. Um, I'd like to rework the iOctal interface to not perform centralized copy ins and copy ends, or to do it more carefully. Um, this would aid the compatibility layers quite a bit. Um, and uh, Conrad is doing some work on compiler generated typeware copy and copy out um, that could be really helpful here. Um, so, we need to think about how we're going to do that. Um, one of our postdocs said he thought he spotted one unused bit in the ioctal command. So, if there's one bit, that means I can use it as new format and all the rules can change. And then we can start rolling things forward. Um, that is a, a thing we can do. It'll be work. Um, but I think it would be a really good long term improvement. Um, and actually, one thing I will point out with, with his work is that because he has typeware copy in and copy out, one of his goals is to have the copy in and copy out only copy actual fields and not copy padding, which means we get rid of a whole class of these. Um, so, yeah, so um, that's probably the goal. Um, one thing we're doing right now in Cherry ABI, and I'm doing just because I'm lazy, is I continue to put the argument array and stuff at the top of the stack, um, following the the um, system by the ABI. This is fine, but it has some some implications for bounds, and but and it's one of the cases where our abstraction assumes that no matter what ABI you're using, you're going to be just splatting things at the top of the stack. Um, so I need to refactor that. <clears throat> um, should also be helpful for ASLR. Um, one of the things right now is that if, if you can, if you can call, even if you had a randomized stack, stack location, if you can cause a get end variable to leak, you know where the stack is. Because it's on the, that's a pointer to the stack. Um, so we should fix that. Um, and I'd like to, well, if, if, if uh, we get to the point that real hardware is coming, then I'd like to upstream this work. Uh, it's going to be a big job, um, but I think it would be really nice. And uh, it's a good chance that we could be the first platform to support this. And if it makes it, if it, makes it big, um, that would be really good for the project. So returning to the, returning to the punchline, We've got a full Unix-like operating system with spatial and referential memory safety. We cover programs, libraries, leakers, um, the whole deal. Um, we cover the hard bits. You know, I've got IOCTO working. The only thing I don't have working is CAM control, um, because translating the CCDs is hard. I actually asked Robert about CAM control a couple years ago. He's like, oh, don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. Well, it doesn't matter for our work, but in terms of having compatibility and having feature parity between compatibility layers, it's a problem. I'd be more than happy to talk to you about it. Great, let's do that. Um, so, you know, some fundamental changes are required, but they're not fundamentally disruptive. Um, and, you know, real stuff works. So, if you want further reading, um, there is cherrycpu.org where redirects to our website at Cambridge. Um, we have a new ISA coming out real soon. Um, we have a long paper um, and an even longer tech report. As an operating systems person, you probably want to read the tech report, not the not the paper, because the paper targets academics, and we're not allowed to talk about implementation too much there. <laughs> uh, and also, this has some stories that you know, paths taken and discarded, uh, which as an implementer you might care about, so you don't take those paths. Um, or if you do, you do it knowing why you're doing it. Um, and then we've got this new paper coming out on a new compressed capability format. So. Now I'm happy to take questions. Yes. So uh, I work in embedded systems. I spend a lot of time writing C code that's going to run in an environment where the only safety net is a watchdog timer. Mm -hmm. uh, what is, uh, I guess, the shortest path uh, from where we are now to me being able to use something like this uh, to, to catch bugs early in, in what I'm doing. Well, so it depends a bit how you're, what, what, what you're doing exactly you want to do there. Your question is how, how to, um, what's the shortest path being, you know, to being able to use something like this in an embedded environment, or at least in the test side of it? Yes. So if you wanted to use it in the test side of an embedded, embedded environment, we have QEMU 
and Terry BSD and whatnot on our website. Um, and we also run a couple of real time OSs. Um, yeah. We have free RTOS because ARPA told us to. We have. Um, yeah, we have L4 and we have um, uh, RTMs. All working to some, to some degree. And it's mostly, you know, it's just, you know, recompile the code. Um, We've added quite a few compiler warnings to help you find the places where you do have to fix things. It's not perfect, but we've made a lot of improvements there. We have a PhD student who's currently writing up who's trying to make all that better. Um, part, part of his dissertation is, so I made it easier. <laughs> uh, so a follow-up to that. Um, it, are uh, like FPGA synthesizable implementations of this available as well? We could make them available. Um, we definitely have the mix one. Um, the unit instructions on the parts of our have a simple one, but it's keeping fun. It's a bit, yeah, it, well, the instructions are old. The last FPGA stuff we put out is old. It is very hard to distribute stuff because the Altera tools mean the Altera IP gets mixed into things. So it's it's definitely possible, um, but it is it is work. Um, I think the risk five stuff we're doing is getting they're gonna make it easier. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, going back to your Register file will probably make performance slightly worse. Is my expectation. There's not just, just from the just from the effect of having a small register set. Yeah, that that is probably get a bit worse. With Risk Five, we're doing a combined register file. Um, and there are there are compatibility downsides of the separate register file. Um, so there's an assumption in in for instance the Sun RPC implementation of OC that the function prototype of something uh, that, that a, a function that takes a few integer or pointer arguments, that that has exactly the same calling invention as a var arms function. Just open and out the same way. Yeah, exactly. So, 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 well, we, we handle. Not really var arms. Yeah, so, and that is that is decidedly not valid C, but it is, it is baked into the. So, like open, open, and FC CMTL are handleable. So we actually do that in user space, um, and we just make them bars and we parse them appropriately. You know, we check the flags and decide whether to read. Um, we actually have to be careful there. Um, if you were in a classic bars implementation, yeah, you just we'll just read the argument, and if it's not there, we'll just get we'll just take whatever garbage is there because we're not going to use it in the kernel. Um, in Cherry, one of the one of the things we did in our current ABI is we put VARGs is always a separate array on the stack and it is a bounded array. So we found quite a few bugs, including quite a bit of open misuse, um, where open was called without a without a mode. Um, and so files are just whatever was in a, their modes, whatever was in the register. But yeah, I, I, there will be some changes there. Um, we also we have a we have internally an updated version of this graph where our performance is actually better than is considerably better than MIPS uh, because we put more work in the optimization. The MIPS LVM packet. Yeah. <laughs> They've never been particularly serious about it. They were chasing mostly MIPS 32. One of the other issues is like the kernel we don't still kill joint point. So when we're parsing arguments, we can do the same thing as the register files, like when we're doing copy and whatnot. The alternative to the register files, with just the extra data annotation and the fit that, they can fit the register files. With just the extra data annotation and the fit that, they can fit the register files. So go on merge, 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 so
Thank you for coming.